So another, uh, you know, just a quote that I wanted to share that I've, I think I've shared here before. Andre Gides writes, know that joy is rarer, more difficult and more beautiful than sadness. He says, once you make this all-important discovery, you must embrace joy as a moral obligation. So the word obligation is a strong one. But again, uh, joy and happiness and well-being are an expression of who we are when we're not fixated on something is wrong, something's missing. It's like those are the clouds, the nimbus clouds in our consciousness. And when we're not fixated on them, there's space for the light to shine through. We don't have to live clouded over. So let's, let's check this one out. Why don't you take a moment and just close your eyes. And, and let this be a pause where you might uh, take some time to arrive. Like just feel your body here. as we did in the meditation, let your awareness scan through your body so that you feel if there's places of tension. This could be another moment to just let go a little, relax a little more. Just like our habit to be grim, our body has a habit to tense up. So part of choosing to be happy is choosing to relax a little. Maybe right now you could choose to relax the brow and just soften the eyes. You might sense the smile spreading through the eyes. And you can choose to sense a half smile at the mouth. Just play with that. Let the inside of the mouth be in a smile. And you can actually choose to smile into your heart. Not to cover over anything, but just to feel the space that's there, the heart space. And just let that smile spread through the body that sense of receptivity and openness. And then sense what happens when you let yourself say, I want to feel happiness, to experience well-being. To sense it as a, a longing of the heart. I want to open to the natural joy of feeling alive, of being alive. And just sense what happens. Just honestly notice what happens in your, your mind, your body. I mean, does it bring up doubt of what's possible? Does it bring up questions of deserving? Does it bring up a sense of excitement at possibility? May I be happy? May I feel happy? Just sense what happens when you said that message. May I feel happy? That's part of the practice, is just to explore letting that intention be in your consciousness. And you can open your eyes when you'd like. Okay. Once we have that intention, it energizes presence. 
because there's an innate wisdom in us that knows that if we long for happiness, we have to come here. It just goes like that. We know. So we sense, you know, happiness can be imagined in the future, we can have memories of it, but it's lived here. There's a uh, old Eskimo quote that goes that yesterday is ashes, tomorrow is wood. Only today does the fire burn brightly. Only today does the fire burn brightly. So the decades of research on mindfulness and on meditation affirm that when we establish a very full presence, a really full presence, then the parts of the brain that correlate with what's called positive emotion, you know, unit of feelings and peace and happiness and well-being light up and you get a deactivation of the afflictive emotions, the limbic area. That's just when there's a full presence. So we're, here we are, we're actually, that's the training we have here basically, is how to be present. But what we find is arriving in full presence has its stages. So it's not like the moment that we say, okay, I'm gonna be here, that all of a sudden those centers light up. It takes some time to arrive and there's layers of what we've been running away from, layers of armoring, layers and tangles of unlived life. So it's a process of coming into a full presence where we're really resting in that yes, letting life be exactly as it is. It's a process. And part of what we go through in that process is we run into the different thoughts and beliefs that keep us from presence. We run into, you know, it's the Buddha said it this way, he said, whatever the practitioner regularly thinks and ponders upon, that will be the inclination of the mind. So as we practice, we find, oh, my mind's gone off to that worry, or my mind's gone off trying to figure out how I can get more of such and such or I'm rehearsing this conversation. So we see that the neural pathways of worry and grasping keep getting reinforced. Part of coming into presence is we just find out about that. It's okay. Noticing it starts loosening it up, just not all at once. The scientists say that neurons that fire together, wire together. So we start noticing, well, if I'm telling myself this, that someone, you know, if I'm always judging in this way, I'm just deepening those grooves of a kind of tight, judgmental, grim person. If I'm always worrying and planning, I'm deepening those pathways, the 1,000 serious moves. So we start being more aware of the way we're caught and loosening the grip and resting more in presence. What are you believing? Are you going around believing something is wrong with me or something's wrong with you? If you are, then to notice it will help you to step back, come back home into the senses. So I'd like to share um, one story of one woman who discover, who's her process of discovering this. And this is a woman who's in a, uh, a high security prison, stills there. She writes, you and I, we share the planet. Perhaps that's all you think. When I look out of the six inch wide slit of a window, I see the same clouds as you. So we share a sky too. A relationship has to start someplace, might as well start big, right? <laughs> And then she goes on to the difference between me and you and she describes, she's been in prison for a long time, she describes the stages of going through, at first she went through huge fear and then anger about being in prison. And there, she says there was always an under or overcurrent, depending on the year of guilt, shame, regret, mortification, basically shooting on myself. This is what these were, she was living in the belief of the world is bad and I am bad. She started noticing all this when she started taking mindfulness classes at some friends of mine, her teaching in this prison. 
And she described some mindfulness helped her to see that and come into the present moment. So I'll tell you a few things she said. She said, I learned how to just be, how to listen to the way my body feels. I learned how to be still, really still. That's where I learned the peace of mind, where it lives. Then I learned I could move in stillness. She says, mindfulness works wherever a person lives, however a person lives. There is stress in every life. The trick is to see the life around the stress. I look at my slit of a window and see the prettiest stars I've ever seen because I can really see now. Why was I here for 15 years before I realized that I couldn't detect yellow flowers under the low-pressure sodium lamps in the courtyard? That's easy. I never bothered to slow down and pay attention, to be mindful, to realize that it is still okay, I am still okay, even if all my best laid plans fall through. It's hard here to not make plans for when I go home. It's harder to face the realization that when I go home might not actually ever get here. Those days make me have to be okay with today. As a Christian, I know I was never promised tomorrow. As a mindful person, I can see that this sky is pretty. This grass is green. If this is the only sidewalk I will ever walk, get to walk on, I'm at a place where I can appreciate that it's not always a bad sidewalk. I have joy in pointing out Orion when I leave my meditation group on Wednesday night. Joy in pointing out Orion when I leave my meditation group on Wednesday night. I took the time to read what she wrote um, in a way to honor her because I think it, there's something about discovering in any circumstance, no matter what it is, that it's possible to come into the present moment and find happiness. That's the possibility. And sometimes you're in circumstances that if you don't, it is pure suffering. Sometimes you can just go into a more kind of distracted trance, but sometimes not. So for her, attending to the breath, to the others that she was practicing with, as it turned out, to flowers, sky, stars, simple things, made her happy. This is Nietzsche. He says, for happiness, how little suffices for happiness, the least thing precisely, the gentlest thing, the lightest thing, a lizard's rustling, a breath, a whisk, an eye glance, little maketh up the best happiness. Be still, be still. So how many of you notice that what really makes you happy are really small things and simple things? Have you noticed that? Yeah, let's, I just, by hands, how many have noticed that, that really when you're, it's little things, the simplest, yeah, thank you. There's something really beautiful in that, that the deepest happiness, really, when we sense it, it's, there, there's very simple things, and it's not actually the thing, it arises from the presence that's there. If there's not presence, there's not happiness. We think we're happy about the, the beauty of the, the clouds as they're moving through the sky or the sound of a child's laugh or um, playing in the ocean waves or whatever it is. We think we're happy because of things. But what's actually allowing us to be happy is the background space of presence itself. You might investigate this, and the way to do it is when there's beauty or kindness or the recognition of the good, simple things, when you're, when you're feeling those moments of happiness, pause and look for the background to that experience within yourself. You'll notice that if you've landed in a moment of well-being, there's a background of presence.
This is uh, a poem by Dorothy Hunt. She says, in this choiceless, never-ending flow of life, there is an infinite array of choices. One alone brings happiness, to love what is. So initially, when we come into presence, we don't love what is. We're just committed enough to say, I'll be present with what is. Okay, realistically speaking, right? We have a sense of pain in our body. We're not going to just enter in and immediately love it, but we're negotiating kind of, okay, I'm going to be present with it. And usually there's a thing in the background saying, and hopefully it'll go away. Okay, right? But then presence begets presence. So if we stay, there's sometimes a sense of, okay, there's a little space. And then we start appreciating that there's some space. And then the pain, then that space regards the pain with some softness or tenderness. And then the what we are is no longer the person fighting the pain, but we are that kind of tender presence. And there's love there and it comes out of just agreeing to be present. What we're really seeking when we say, I want to be happy, is that presence. So tonight, I'm just we're going to close in a few moments, but tonight, really, the, the message is we, we create our prison. We're in prison as long as we're wanting life to be different as long as we're on this track of a thousand serious moves where we're trying to avoid bad things and get more good things. We're in a kind of prison because we're trapped and we're removed from the place where happiness and wholeness and presence is possible. So the pathway home, decide that well-being matters and that's the wisdom place that kind of intuits, it's possible. We don't have to be in a kind of resigned trance and just be grim. We don't have to be on our deathbed to regret that we weren't true to ourselves. So decide on happiness. And then we become mindful of all the thoughts and patterns that keep us small and keep coming back to presence because right here in this aliveness of this body and heart there's a deeper truth. Okay, so decide on well-being, keep coming back, keep coming back. And as we do, we discover that happiness is intrinsic in presence. So let's explore that a little together. We'll close with that kind of investigation of how coming back leads us home. In a way, the inquiry for this practice is, isn't it true that what we really long for is already here? Isn't it true that what we really long for is already here? Always and already here. In this final meditation, in a very simple way, just invite yourself into the moment. You might feel the breath. Feel your heart, whatever state your heart is in. And mentally whisper I love, and then fill in the blank. So just repeat it over and over again. It may be that I love looking at clouds, I love walking in nature, I love a particular person, but just mentally whisper, I love, I love, and just see what comes up.
make things up if they don't come to mind. Just play with it. Pick one thing that's come to mind that you know you love, where the love is strong. It might be a person, something beautiful, your dog. And bring that close in so you can really feel the loving, what you love about this being or experience. And let the love be as big as it is. You can even let the object of the love drop away so you just feel the loving itself. sense within that loving, a presence, an awakeness, and a deep sense of well-being. Sense how much space there is in that loving for whatever arises. If it's painful, then there's tenderness. If it's beautiful, there's loving-kindness. In this choiceless, never-ending flow of life, there's an infinite array of choices. One alone brings happiness, to love what is. May we open ourselves to the natural joy of being alive, to happiness and well-being. And may all beings everywhere discover their potential to love without holding back and to cherish and open to this life with all their being. May all beings be free. Namaste.